You know, increasingly we live in a world, in a country that is becoming increasingly non-Christian, increasingly anti-Christian, and a lot of the laws that we are seeing passed in our society today are ones that go against what I would say is our Christian ethics. We've seen it with passing of laws around abortion, around um, prostitution, um, there's a whole lot of areas. And um, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, we saw once again the media uh, put out there the fact that Marion Street, uh, an MP, is pushing to have a private members bill on euthanasia um, put through and, and heard before Parliament and, and voted on. Now, it's a private members bill, which means that it goes into the ballot box and they get randomly drawn. And depending, you know, if it gets drawn, that's when it will actually go before Parliament and heard. So it could actually sit in that box for a couple of years and not actually be heard. But the media don't care. They thought, oh, here's another great chance to push the whole issue of euthanasia. So we saw a couple of days in the papers and the newspaper when they were pushing the issue again. So I thought, once again, it's probably worthwhile just having a quick look at the issue of euthanasia and seeing what is the basis for us as Christians for being so strongly against it. Why do we stand against the issue of euthanasia? Why do we do that? And to clarify, I guess, a few of the definitions about what it actually is and uh, what we do stand for. So that's what we're going to look at today. A few years ago, you may have, may have seen on TV1, there was a documentary called The Promise, the Leslie Martin story. And it was a story that explored the, the life of a woman called Leslie Martin. She was a known campaigner for euthanasia. And she was charged with two counts of attempted murder after she published her book, To Die Like a Dog. And in that book, she described injecting her terminally ill mother, who was suffering the end stages of bowel cancer, with a morphine overdose. And then later, because that didn't kill her, smothering her with a pillow after promising not to let her linger. And she wrote about this in her book. Martin was an intensive care nurse. She cared for her mother Joy for five months before she died. And it was after reading the book that the New Zealand police decided to pursue a homicide investigation. High Court Justice John Wilde said he accepted that Martin had acted from love and compassion for her terminally ill mother, but he criticised her for showing a lack of remorse and even arrogance, saying she had given the impression she thought she was above the law and would even act in a similar way again in similar circumstances. The prosecutor, Andrew Cameron, said he too felt compassion for Martin's situation, but had to balance that against the value of human life. Sanctity of life, and it's important to hear this, sanctity of life <coughs> underpins our law in the most fundamental way, he said. Sanctity of life the desire to preserve life, to see that life is sacred and precious, underpins our law in New Zealand in a most fundamental way. I think we can all of us sympathise with Martin's situation. There is probably nothing worse in this world than watching a loved one dying before your very eyes, feeling the grief, the pain, the helplessness, and wanting desperately in some way to ease the suffering. I've seen it time and time again in hospital with terminally ill cancer patients and their family gathered around the bedside, you know, up in the ward. You know, they have a special room set aside for palliative care. And I've seen it with a person who's going through the last few days of their life and the family just gathering and, and just feeling the pain that's going on for that family. But as lawyers, ethicists and others will tell you, legislating because of difficult cases makes for bad laws. And while we might feel compassion for Martin and others in his situation, it would be wrong for us to allow that compassion to push us into creating laws that are based on individual and very subjective situations rather than on principles like the sanctity of life. But that's exactly the place that we are in today. A few years ago, Peter Brown's death with dignity bill was only narrowly defeated in Parliament. And while I am grateful that the new makeup of Parliament with the current National Party, who are the party that most strongly stand against euthanasia, means that even if Marion Street's bill was to come out of the ballot box during the next year or so, it would probably fail, the issue is not going to go away anytime soon. There will be other MPs, and there are like Marion Street and others, lobbyists like the Auckland Voluntary Euthanasia Society, who will keep pushing this issue again and again and again who are trying to mould and shape New Zealanders' opinions through the media and elsewhere 
until the time is right again to put forward another bill, another motion. The issue is not going to go away. And I think it is important and worthwhile clearing the emotive decks and asking yourselves where we might stand on this issue as Christians and why we think the way we think. But I think it's also important to clarify what it is we're talking about. Because there's a lot of confusion around euthanasia. A lot of people think it's one thing when it's actually not. So we need to be clear about what it is that euthanasia actually is, what it is that a law is trying to actually pass. Otherwise we might, may find ourselves supporting something that we don't actually want. So firstly, euthanasia is not about legalising the right to take your own life. Because suicide in itself is not a criminal offence. Today we acknowledge that someone who attempts to take their own life is a someone in need of actually in need of help. And criminalising them is totally the wrong response. According to the New Zealand Crimes Act, the police have the right to intervene and to try and prevent someone from taking their own life based on those principles of the sanctity of life. And if they are successful in that intervention, they're not going to suddenly slap handcuffs on them and haul them off to prison or a cell. They're going to find care and interventions for them that are actually going to help them deal with the issues that brought them to that place in their life where they feel that they can no longer carry on. It's about providing help and care rather than locking them away. They will not be prosecuted for trying to take their life. And likewise, euthanasia is not about the right to refuse treatment when you're in hospital. People already have that right under our current laws, where patients or their surrogates can ask that unwanted medical treatment be withheld or even withdrawn, despite the fact, despite the fact that that may increase the likelihood that the patient will die. No one needs to be hooked up to machines against their will. Neither the law nor medical ethics requires that everything be done to keep a person alive in those last stages of life. Insistence against the patient's wishes that death be postponed by every means available is contrary to law and practice. It is also cruel and inhumane. There comes a time, there comes a time when continued attempts to cure are not compassionate anymore. To try and eke out another hour or two is not compassionate. It's not wise. And it's not medically sound. That's where palliative care comes in. That is the time when all the effort should be directed to making the patient's remaining time comfortable. Where the interventions are directed to alleviating the pain and the other symptoms, as well as to the provision of emotional and spiritual support for both the patient and the patient's family. And again, that is not euthanasia. There is a huge difference between not providing treatment that will prolong life and the choice to act in a deliberate way to end life, as Leslie Martin did. To put it plainly, euthanasia is about making it legal for you to be killed by another person. That's what euthanasia is. It's giving someone else the right to take your life. And we have to be very careful before we open that door of Pandora's box. Because despite all the legal safeguards, who knows where it will end. So how can the Bible, how can Christian ethics help us here? Well actually it can help us a lot. Because the Bible gives us some very clear principles to live by and to guide us in our decision making. To begin with, our Christian worldview, that set of core beliefs that we have as Christians that informs our values, values that in turn influence the laws that we pass and the institutions that we set up, and finally the, the values that are the deciding factor in the way we behave, states very clearly that human beings, even from conception, are made in the image of God. In other words, as Christians, we believe that every human being living today bears the image of God. That we are made with a purpose. That we are not an accident of evolution. That we are special. That we are unique. More than animals, than alone of all creation, we have the possibility of relating to our Creator. And because of that, 
We believe that human life is precious, sacred, and must be protected and preserved at almost all costs. Which is why, for example, the Catholic Church is so strongly against abortion. Which is why the very first hospitals in the world were started by Christians. Which is why Christianity and Christians are often those who are at the forefront of movements to end poverty. Slavery, think of William Wilberforce, a very strong Christian. Discrimination, think of Martin Luther King, and so on. And the list could just go on and on and on. Shaftesbury, who was there uh, trying to end poverty in England and the, uh, the, the workhouses and things like that. For Christians, because of what we believe to be true about what it means to be a human being, human life is sacred. It is sacred. And anything to do with it should never, ever be taken lightly. And where do we get this view? Why is it part of our worldview as a Christian? Genesis chapter 1, where God states very clearly that human beings are made in the image of God. But also from the fact that the whole Bible is about God seeking us out in order to have a relationship with us. A quest he is so driven by that in the end he is willing to send his son to live and die for us. Human beings are precious. We are precious, every single one of us. And there is no greater evidence of that than the fact that Jesus Christ died for us. Romans 5, 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But if you want a more specific example of how that principle of human life is enshrined in Scripture, you might turn to Exodus 21, where Moses laid down some laws deriving from the Ten Commandments, and in particular, the fourth commandment, you shall not kill. And in verses 22 to 25, laws are laid down concerning even the most vulnerable members of humanity. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman, and that she ends up giving birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, then the offender must be fine whatever the woman's husband demands in the court allowed. But if there is serious injury, then you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so on. Here in Exodus, it's pretty clear that even the life of a premature child is seen as precious in the eyes of God because it is a human life. So I think you can see, from a Christian perspective, human life is valuable, and every effort should be made to keep it safe. And it's this principle that forms the basis of our Christian ethics in opposition to euthanasia. But it's not the only reason. And what I want to do is just highlight maybe just a couple of things around other issues that are raised in the euthanasia debate. Number one, euthanasia advocates would have us believe that patients with terminal illnesses only have two options. They can either die slowly and unrelieved suffering and pain, or they can be euthanized. That's simply not true. Advances in pain relief today, the work of the hospice movement, and others means that virtually all of the unpleasant symptoms associated with terminal illnesses can either be relieved or substantially alleviated. Not all, of course. And dying is never, ever pleasant. And losing someone you love will always be hard. But we can make people in that situation quite comfortable today. Which is a far better option for them and their families. To give them comfort and the time in a precious time together rather than taking your life. Interestingly, Holland, <coughs> which has had laws that allow euthanasia for quite a while now, which he has a very poor hospice movement, whereas in England, which has rejected those laws and continues to do so, has a very strong hospice movement providing research into palliative care and care of the terminally ill. I'd rather be in England than Holland. Number two, it is argued that euthanasia would be voluntary. And this is a lie. That the patient would objectively request it themselves. However, this totally ignores human nature. Patients who are terminally ill often suffer from confusion, dementia, depression. The elderly may feel that they are a burden to their relatives. Some may feel useless about that they have nothing to live for. There may be pressure from those who stand to gain financially, including the professionals who are under pressure to maximise resources and meet budgets and so on. Some patients who have been wrongly treated and are suffering as a result will feel euthanasia is their only option, when in fact a simple change in treatment may make all the difference. And I've seen that time again. People who get a change in medication suddenly find that their mood can be altered 
and they get a totally different perspective on life. You know, one week they're wanting to end their lives, and the next week with a change in medication that we can, that, you know, that they can afford, um, suddenly life is a little bit different. The result is in that some cases, patients would be euthanized unwillingly. And in Holland, about a thousand patients a year are killed by their doctors without their consent, out of 3,000 doctor-assisted suicides. That's a third. In Holland, a third has been revealed in the studies of all euthanasias are actually involuntary. Some would argue that it's also about our right to choose. But you know, all rights are in taken in a context. We live in a society, and all of our rights are actually restricted to some degree. How fast you travel on the road, you know, all sorts of things. Our rights are, can never be seen as something that stands in isolation. And from a Christian perspective, we are not God. God is God. And our rights have to be taken into account that there is a God who actually is the author of all life, the provider of all life, and in his hand all life is actually ultimately held. Euthanasia is not going to go away. It's going to come again and again and again. And Christians, as Graham mentioned at the, at the beginning, need to speak up. Alice Noble, on my behalf, wrote to both of our local MPs last week, wrote to Damien and to Chris. Got a three replies from Chris, really impressed, basically saying that he personally stands against it, that he doesn't see Marion's bill coming up in the near future, but that you know the National Party itself, um, on principles like the sanctity of life, would stand against euthanasia at this present point in time. Damien hasn't replied yet, but MPs estimate that for every person who bothers to contact them, there's another 100 people out there who feel the same way. It's because so few people actually contact their MPs. So what, what was that, Graham? encourage you is this, is that when the issue does come up, and it will come up again, it will be a bill that is put before our parliament, and especially if it's a conscience vote, that you write to your MPs and express your view. Because if a hundred people write saying, we don't feel this is the right thing to do, then that in their eyes represents 10,000 people out there. And that's nearly about a third of the electorate. So, we have a responsibility to let our voice be heard. 